Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends of interregional cooperation, we see the participants joining, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on drivers of innovation in rural areas. We have more than 90 participants signed up for today's session, which is brought to you by the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform. Indeed, despite the summer break, very glad to have you with us. We have three very experienced speakers in the agenda today from the European Commission, from France, from Finland. We will give the floor to them soon. But first, uh, dear participants, please allow me to introduce my colleagues to you. First and foremost, you already see him, Mark Pattinson, who is our senior expert for research and innovation in the team of the Policy Learning Platform. And not to forget about Eugenie Supplisson. Eugenie, maybe you can also switch on your camera. Perfect. Who is, you know, pulling the strings in the background, who is ensuring the smooth technical implementation of today's webinar. Indeed, some words of housekeeping. Uh, please note, dear participants, this webinar will be recorded. The recording together with the presentations and the key learnings will be made available on the website of Interreg Europe. Furthermore, even though we have exciting speakers with us, we also want you to get involved. You see the menu on the right hand side of your screen. You see the so called questions function where you can put questions, you can share your comments, or if you would like to share information, please do not hesitate to put in there. And with Eugenie and Mike, we will share with the entire audience. Don't be shy, use this opportunity, raise your question. Uh, of course, these events, they live from interactivity. Before giving the floor, uh, floor to Mark, who will guide you through today's session, ladies and gentlemen, two words about the framework, which is, as you can see on the slide, the Interreg Europe program, as the name indicates, a European-wide cooperation um, program providing funding for public authorities, local regional authorities, the managing authorities of structural funds, allowing them to cooperate, to learn from each other, to exchange on policy challenges, in the current programming period on challenges related to research and innovation, SME competitiveness, low carbon economy, as well as environment and resource efficiency. You can see all member states of the European Union covered, plus Norway and Switzerland are full members of our program. And I can confirm local and regional uh, actors, policymakers from all member states are very active in the nearly 260 projects funded by the program. You can see the budget, 350 million euros invested in interregional learning by the program so far. But more than that, the program has launched a policy learning platform which aims at fully exploiting the results of the projects. They have many good practices, many policy solutions, or sometimes failure from which you can learn the most. Furthermore, the policy learning platform aims at reaching out to those cities and regions which, for one reason or another, do not have the possibility to participate in Interreg Europe projects. Well, a dedicated team of experts has been recruited for this task, and I think this is my buzzword, Mark, to hand over to you because you are our expert for research and innovation, and I think rural innovation is a topic which is of high relevance at all policy levels in Europe. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Torsten. Uh, welcome from me as well to all of you. And I hope that most of you are, are dry, given the uh, strange meteorological uh, phenomena we're, we're experiencing in some parts of Europe. Um, so um, today's uh, agenda uh, is a very uh, structured but very uh, tight uh, process. So I'm not going to talk too long because you are no doubt connecting today uh, to listen to our real experts. So I'll ask the, the three of them to turn their cameras on. We've got Mr. Olavi Lutonen from DG Connect at the European Commission, uh, Technologies for Smart Communities. And then from the Interreg Europe project community, uh, joining us from France today is Clive Peckham, uh, representing the Carpe Digem uh, uh, project, and Ninette Chanitou, 
the uh, representative of the Regional Council of Kainu in Finland and the Bridges Project. So they will be the um, sort of a set piece of our menu. Um, we will then follow those presentations with uh, an interaction with them as the panel, but that process will be greatly facilitated if you are asking questions via the chat. Uh, so um, really want to make this as interactive as possible, given the sort of tools that we have, but it's an important means for you to either share a project experience or to uh, ask us to put a question to one of our uh, three speakers. Uh, by means of introduction, uh, we always like to uh, get a few uh, people waking up and pressing buttons. So, Eugenie, uh, we'll have a poll question, very straightforward. This is a, you know, uh, this is the start for ten points. Uh, does your region have a dedicated rural development strategy? Three answers: yes, no, don't know. If you don't know, then it's obviously something for you to do tomorrow. Equally, use the chat to submit any links and documents you'd want to share, and we can then uh, use our policy learning platform tools to do that. So um, we can uh, hopefully uh, get the results of Genie uh, when you can make it available. We see the results coming in. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, majority fortunately have yes and some don't knows. So we've got 30% uh, who are in the don't knows who are going to uh, find out tomorrow why they didn't know and uh, what they can perhaps uh, take from today's session for, for learning uh, and to changing with those responsible for the development strategy. So if we go back now, thank you, Eugenie. Yep, uh, Looking at some of the drivers of rural innovation, and just as a means of giving some context for uh, what we're going to talk about uh, today, I can just get my lovely picture off the screen. Oh, it's not always easy. Apologies for this. There we go. Um, the first one is, as we know, you know, rural areas ac exist across Europe, but um, they do host a quarter of the EU's population. So half the territory, quarter of the population. So lots of businesses, lots of people living there. One of the key issues that many of you face in, in your rural development strategy is, is looking how to ensure uh, the competitiveness of either location uh, and by extension, the businesses that are located with you uh, to ensure they remain competitive and your rural regions remain competitive business locations. The digital transition and the infrastructure that are being uh, deployed, uh, I think more rapidly now than ever before, are helping both uh, businesses uh, stay and grow, but also attract businesses. So the deployment is, is, is a clear uh, priority for a number of you. Connecting uh, the sources of knowledge, uh, technology, uh, uh, development are also important. And a number of rural areas are putting in place uh, sectorial strategies, competence centers that try and pinpoint their differentiation, their strengths, uh, to make sure their SMEs have access to the best knowledge uh, at competitive prices and, and time considerations. The ability for more rural industries, uh, and it's also a case in, in urban areas that haven't really been, let's say, uh, initiated to the digital transformation, whether it's simple click and collect from a farm shop or from ensuring uh, you know, a manufacturing plant can get the uh, same level of information data security in rural locations, technology deployment is obviously there to help the transformation of traditional industries. The policy uh, context is important because you each policy interaction, whether you're in rural, digital, sectorial, human resources, training, we need coherence and complementarities. And Part of the process, I think many of you in the Interreg Europe uh, community and in the research and innovation community are uh, closely aligned with your smart specialization strategies. So the 
type of services that are available for companies in one location need to be uh, available in all parts of the territory. And the new S3 strategy has a sort of enabling condition to try and ensure the territorial dimension, the disparities are, are reduced over time. Last but not least, the notice of COVID uh, that has been growing everywhere and then declining, then coming back. The, 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 the challenges uh, we see uh, in rural areas are different from urban, sometimes more positive uh, solutions exist. But overall, we're looking at uh, the opportunity for more resilience. Uh, we've seen, for example, some of the uh, uh, islands in the Atlantic doubling the number of premises they offer for digital uh, infrastructure, smart buildings, because people can work from uh, afar. People have good broadband, they can work from the middle of Atlantic and serve markets in, on the mainland Europe. And secondly, more networks are growing to ensure that uh, knowledge is shared, uh, good ideas are, 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 are you know, deployed, and we're not all reinventing the wheel. And at Interreg Europe, the policy learning platform, we like to try and ensure that you learn from others. Um, we could have probably put a lot more uh, logos on this, but here you see a selection of projects that you can find on the Interreg Europe platform and policy learning platform, where there are good practices, where there are networks of individuals uh, and uh, expertise that probably meets most of the uh, challenges that I've just described, whether it's the technology, uh, whether it's the uh, sectorial, if we look at, you know, agri-renaissance, uh, uh, Carpe Digem, you'll see, has a focus on the, the digital erudite, on the digital uh, regions for food on sector. So lots of interesting avenues for you to explore. Presentations will obviously be shared with you after this meeting, but some of the main tools that we deploy at the policy learning platform, uh, workshops, so we've got uh, examples there, policy briefs that have a more detailed uh, insight and discussion of some of the challenges and the likely sources of information you could use to develop a particular response to a policy challenge. Webinars. Well, yeah. Today is a, is, is a good example. Uh, policy Digest, uh, peer reviews. It's one of our flagship projects where we seek uh, to help uh, with experts uh, what some of your uh, challenges are in a very practical sense. So as you can see, this, this slide shows you uh, a selection, uh, if not all the recent peer reviews that we've undertaken in and about uh, Europe. Very different subjects. Some have dealt with some of the uh, rural issues, the digital transformation issues that we are going to talk about uh, today. Basically, uh, for those who are not familiar with this process, it's an open call procedure. So you can submit a uh, proposal tomorrow. And the idea is that a region or a, an agency uh, or a city uh, has a policy challenge and they would like some expert insights and uh, uh, policy suggestions on how they could either resolve a problem or tackle uh, an issue they see coming on the horizon. And so the policy learning platform will work with you to create a sort of issues and challenge paper. And the most important and the value added part of this is to uh, bring to your region five, six experts, we call them peers, uh, who then spend two days either digitally or physically as was the case in the city of Tartua last month. Our colleague uh, Torsten, who you just met, uh, took a group of peers. Uh, myself, my colleague Arno, we were virtually in Hungary uh, 10 days ago and last week in, uh, in Croatia on the digital transformation. And intense meetings, but after two days, you have an action plan produced by some of the best experts in Europe, which we co-select with you. So the, the link there enables you to find out more details. As I said, it's uh, one of the best selling, if you want me to, don't mind me using that phrase, uh, current tools of the policy learning platform, because it really does have a concrete impact on what you're doing. And uh, I'd recommend it uh, for your consideration. Okay, enough about the introduction. Um, I would now like to uh, introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, very pleased to have uh, Olavi Lutunen from DG Connect with us. Uh, he's got, as you'll soon see, uh, great knowledge of uh, some of the 
technology and network challenges that are being deployed for uh, ensuring Europe's rural, peri-urban areas become smarter and more competitive. So, Olavi, the floor is yours. I think Eugenie will now give you the uh, control of the slides and uh, we'll intervene a bit later for some questions. Thank you, Eugenie. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, uh, my name is Olavi. Uh, that's the uh, easier name to use. I, I, I always say to the French speakers that it's it's very easy to remember. It's like Olavi, uh, as you would say in French. Uh, but I come originally from a rural island of the southwestern coast of Finland in the Turku archipelago, uh, where uh, our small farm has been in the family since 1732. Uh, well, we don't know if they were actually farming in 1732, but at least the, uh, the, the farm area has been in the family for quite some time. But I'm now based in Brussels. Uh, I've been working for the, for the European Commission. Uh, for over 20 years now. Uh, I've been working especially with uh, living labs, so experimentation, uh, as well as um, uh, smart cities, and now lately much also with smart communities, so smaller, smaller areas and regions. And uh, I would, uh, let's see here, right, so uh, I, I will especially uh, talk about uh, a, a rural smart communities uh, topic, which we have had in the Horizon 2020 program, which produced two rather large scale pilots, uh, altogether a 30 million uh, funding uh, by the European Union. And uh, these are, I will go over here, so let's see now if I have control over my slides. I don't. Uh, let's see now. Yeah. Olavi, you have control over your slides. Uh, right, I'm supposed to, but they are not moving. At least I cannot see them moving. Do you still see my title slide? Yes. Yes, it's confirm it's not moving. Maybe if you click on the screen with your mouse, you can maybe change the slides. And if you want, I can also show now, now they now they are moving. Yeah, something something happened. But now they now I got got it to move. Yeah. Okay. So um so we have uh <clears throat> In the, in the last years, uh, we have very much been going uh, from working with mainly with smart cities to really working with smart communities. This is also what Roberto Viola, our uh, director general of DigiConnect, has very much uh, emphasized that we really need to work with the smart communities, which is a word which we take to mean actually all communities, including cities, and all the way to smart villages. Uh, so, and and we have also gone from systems thinking into ecosystems thinking, and from a kind of more top-down design to citizen empowerment. And uh, even for uh, key networks such as open and agile smart cities, uh, they have started working much more on this community by community basis. And uh, as I mentioned already, we have this new major initiative of 30 million uh, funding uh, where we are large scale piloting uh, on rural digital service platforms, innovation ecosystems in a smart village approach and with very much also the standards at the forefront. And these project started uh, on the 1st of January this year. Uh, now, with regard to the standards at the forefront, uh, we are especially talking about what we call minimal interoperability mechanisms. Now, uh, they are also called MIMS for short, 
and, and they are addressing the interoperability of data, systems and services. Uh, they have been developed and validated uh, first mainly with, with cities, but then also with smaller communities uh, in large scale pilot projects such as Synchronicity. And they are now extended especially to the rural smart communities in two projects uh, which are called Auroral and the rural and overall we call our approach the living in EU uh, movement and I'll, I'll come back to that. I will take first the de rural uh, project. They have started 1st of January this year. It's a three and a half year project. Uh, roughly 15 million funded by the EU and their target and mission is to connect the rural areas to the services that the rural areas need. Now of course they have only just started so they are not yet there but this is their mission. So they are through this co-development and rollout of a digital marketplace of services. Their aim is to offer value to the services end users, especially in the rural areas and thereby, of course, create jobs and quality of life in the European rural areas. Uh, it is a consortium of 31 partners from nine countries. Uh, you can see that there are four pilot regions, uh, especially uh, from uh, Spain, Sweden, Croatia and the Netherlands. And uh, here you can see the other partners with a Spanish coordinator called TIC Biomed. Uh, so they are, they will be working with service providers, especially from areas such as public health and care, other local service providers with municipalities. So it's cross-cutting. Now they will start more with some sectors, but in principle, it is cross-cutting. It is not only uh, focusing on any one sector. And uh, here you can see the main piloting regions in the different parts of Europe quite well spread out but later in the coming years they will also have what is called an open call uh, for additional uh, participants with uh, let's say smaller projects in this kind of cascading funding mode uh, but that will be in the in the years to come they are not there yet but they are working to get to the de rural marketplace. And these are the main expected results uh, for ecosystems in the different pilot areas, but in one interoperable platform. Uh, and so these are the contact points and the both on the website. Uh, for D rural. Now the second project is called Auroral and that is an architecture for a unified regional and open digital ecosystems for smart communities and rural areas, large-scale application. They have 25 partners from 11 European member states uh, with eight uh, pilot regions. And their approach is very much also the co-development and focus on interoperability uh, as we could already see in the rural as well. And so it is about ecosystems, about empowerment of citizens, communities, regions, including smart villages in the center. Uh, they have these 
pilot regions mentioned here from again from the north to the south and middle. So Aurora is expected to be a driver of the emergence of a widespread network of smart communities in Europe and as well contribute to balancing the urban and rural opportunities. These are the expected impacts uh, of Aurora. I will not read all of them. You will have the slides afterwards in any case, but indeed starting from brokerage platforms and demonstrations and showcasing this cross-sectorial platform and with uh, focus on interoperability. And then, of course, overcoming the digital divide between rural and urban areas and increasing the number of services and applications, strengthening the links with other programs as well. These are the rural partners. Uh, they are led by uh, Portuguese region of Alentejo uh, with uh, Marcos Nogueira and Paula Peiro in the lead. Here you can see their contact details, uh, which you will have on the slides afterwards in case you want to get in touch directly. And now Aurora has been leading this major event. Portuguese EU presidency event, which we were celebrating in the week of May 3rd to 9th. Uh, it was to some extent a hybrid event, but of course, due to the circumstances, mainly online this year. Uh, but you will be able to see uh, still the sessions on video. You will be able to see uh, the, the presentations at uh, www.eu-smart.community. So in case you are interested to see this all week program going from more technical presentations towards let's meet the mayors towards more overall high-level view uh, and the regional view. So do feel free to go over to, to the EU Smart Community website. And uh, if you click on the point agenda there, you will find the presentations and the uh, videos of the event there. Now, since we have had a very positive experience with the first uh, event, already our Portuguese uh, partners have decided that there will be a 2022 edition, very hopefully then physically as well as, uh, as, well as online uh, on, from 9th to 13th of May, 2022 uh, in Alentejo and online. So, but also for that purpose, you will find the more detailed information on the EU Smart Community website. Now, finally, I would like to emphasize the Living in EU movement, as we call it, uh, which started on the, during the Finnish EU presidency in 2019 when the first, uh, first the Oulu mayor in Finland, uh, as well as ministers from Finland and Estonia first signed the Living in EU declaration. And there now, by now we have roughly 100, close to 100, mostly city mayors signing, uh, but that you can also sign as supporters. There are by now about 70 supporters. So if you are not a public administration leader, but for example, a company or a university or an NGO, 
well, then you can sign as a supporter. But I very much advise you if you are interested in cooperation on the digital transformation in cities and communities, especially the European way, I would very much uh, encourage you to go to living-in.eu, so living in EU for short, and uh, look at the declaration and consider joining the movement over there. So this is where you can sign and support and like and join the movement. Thank you for your attention. Glad to take any questions later on. Perfect timing. Uh, uh, au vie, uh, as I am with my French accent. Uh, uh, it, uh, it sounds very poetic. Uh, so that, that's uh, nice to, to have that. Um, indeed, I, I, I've got questions, but I think I will uh, uh, wait till the uh, uh, full presentations have been made and like that we can uh, link them. But two, perhaps I can put in your mind, Olevi, so you can think about them. I, I think one of the challenges for all of us, whether we're a policymaker in a village, uh, city, region, up to the European Commission, is the sort of complementarities and synergies. And clearly when dealing with rural, um, it would be interesting to hear what other DGs that uh, maybe have uh, considered or you've cooperated with on, on these issues of uh, you know, the smart communities and now living in the EU, but we can come on to that later. So thanks again. Um, you can um, sit quietly and listen to the next two presentations. Um, and the first one, uh, it's a pleasure to have Clive Peckham from Nièvre Numérique uh, with us, who's going to give us an insight from both his uh, perspective at Nièvre Numérique, but also some of the experiences that has been uh, developed and some of the good practices that have come out of the Carpe Digem uh, project. So, uh, Clive, if you can put your camera microphone on and just shout out, uh, shift yeah. slide, and I will I will do so. That's fine. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for the first slide, and thanks very much to the Policy Learning Platform for the, this opportunity to contribute to this very stimulating, interesting uh, webinar looking at drivers for rural innovation and. Uh, I think before really just giving a very brief overview of the, the current project we're working on in Nieuwe Numérique, I think it'd be very good to go back to one of the uh, key documents produced by the European Commission looking at um, smart specialization and innovation in rural areas, the report produced in the, now about seven years ago in, in 2014, where one of the key points identified was there is this lack of density of business and business networks in, um, in rural areas. But we we do have these endogenous local resources. But what is absolutely of crucial importance, and they identified this now seven years ago, is a combination of assets. That if you are if we are to reach this critical mass to ensure um, innovation, prosperity, social harmony, social well-being, that we must absolutely work at all levels to ensure that the assets that we have are brought together within local areas within our territories but also across Europe and across European rural areas. So I think this is, this is absolutely fundamental and this is why the title of this presentation is about collaboration and I think I should have also included the word inclusion that if you are to achieve these, these strategies, if you are to achieve this, this spread and inclusion of all of our stakeholders, businesses, communities, in, in, in being innovators, then this is fundamental. So just a, a quick bit about the Carpadesian project. It's a, it's a current Interreg Europe project with partners from various rural areas of Europe, but also islands. And we have Madeira and Mallorca in there, Bulgaria as being one of the um, one of the, the, the Eastern European countries which are which they themselves admit are far behind in um, the issue of innovation. So this is number one. Projects like this and programs like Interreg Europe are key for ensuring that we can actually cooperate together, we collaborate together, and we work together towards achieving the inclusion of all of the European space and all of the European people and business in digital innovation. So what I want to do today is really to give you some examples from the different levels of cooperation, cooperation within communities, 
cooperation within the framework of uh, an Interreg Europe project, and then also future cooperation where we have identified key challenges and a project which is currently underway. So next slide, please, Mark. Uh, what I want to do first is to go to a community which is in the Nièvre. The Nièvre is the westernmost um, county or département of the region of Burgundy in France. It's the most rural and it's also the one which currently has one of the highest rates of our migration. But the, the specific market town which I'll be referring to here at Lorton has now reversed that out migration. And I think clearly innovation has to, it has at its purpose, to ensure the economic, social and well-being of the rural areas of Europe. And I think Lorme is a classic example of by actually creating this collaboration within a community, you can then create the collaboration and the, the partnerships which lead to prosperity and social well-being. So just quickly, just go through the, the, each one of these photographs is really telling a story. Now, Lorme is a market um, town of about 1,300 people. It's the, the, the key town of a small rural area as well. We, we call it a rural service centre. It has schools, it has a very small hospital, it has doctors, it has shops. So it provides key services to that rural community. But what they've been trying to do now for well over 20 years is actually develop it into a service centre, an innovation centre for, the, for the, the citizens, but also the wider community. And the first um, picture you see with, where there's a senior citizen with two kids is from their digital hub. Now, the digital hub was, was founded originally about 20 years ago, one, one of the first in France and one of the first in Europe. Everyone's talking about hubs now, but Lorme is one of the very first that was ever set up. It, it became a physical structure about 2008 from the converted abattoir that had gone out of use. And now it has office space, it is a training center, there's, there's a co-working space, there's a whole, there's a fab lab where people within that community can exchange and develop. And also, I think one thing here is create. It's not just about using the services that come from outside, it's about creating them within the community. You see on the right, there's a, there's a fab lab now, which has been in operation. And this is not just about you know, doing some experimentation. People use it now for the, they started businesses there. It's used for education. So, and then you see there's a little newspaper article there, sorry, it's a bit small, but we actually had a, a visit from the um, Korean Institute, of, I think it's called Korean Rural Economy Institute, who were looking at the issue of smart villages, and they wanted to see the one the operation in Europe, so we, we took them to Long. I think they were very surprised, and one of the things is, you see the mural there on the left, the village is not only about digital innovation, it's about getting the citizens involved, this collaboration in redesigning their village. And one of the key things the citizens said, said, our town is boring. It's cluttered, it, it, it's brown, the shutters are brown, there's no pictures. They started this process of painting the shutters, painting murals, really giving life back. So it's about giving economic life, digital life, community life. So it's recreating this atmosphere where people feel they can contribute and innovate. And finally, we've got this Make EC. Now, Make, make EC is a, is a, a project to set up a, a, a maker space, which is really is a next step up, let's say, from the Fab Lab. It's actually starting to create jobs, people can create and prototypes and, and turn really. It's like a small factory, it's a multi purpose factory. And this is the first in rural farms. And now they're in Marseille, they're near Paris, and this is part of a national network. And they've chosen Lorme because of its ability to innovate. And I think this is it. Innovation creates innovation, creates innovation, and then it creates spread out to the other rural communities. On to the next slide, please, Mark. Th these are just some documents and case studies on Lorme, which you may well be interested in. This is very much for, for you to look at. Three ones produced for the ENRD. So I'll go quickly on to the next slide now. So that's for reference. Now that's an example of reason really why as an structure near Benimerique is here, because we have this atlas, we have this real push for innovation within our county. And within the Carpe Diem project, as we know, Interregio is an exchange of experience. And during the COVID crisis, young winemakers in Slovenia were looking for new markets because their traditional ones had been going. So they created um, with the help of the University of Ljubljana and the new Divina um, Wine Hub, which is both there to help them sell and help them to innovate, a 
virtual wine tasting um, program, which then enabled people to be sent wine that could then be tasted and bought and promoted. We decided we'd had enough of, um, and this is not, not in anywhere comment on the current webinar, it's just saying, we've been doing these webinars within our, let's do something a bit different, what can we do? So he said, let's do a, let's put this, do the virtual wine tasting at European now. So we had it in France, had it in Mallorca and in Slovenia. And it, well, the idea was to have a central wine um, sommelier, a wine expert who was in Slovenia, and we had tasting groups in different countries, but, and we had, as you were doing polls, we were consulting, we, and we were consulting all the participants, really trying to make them participate and create real interaction between them, but also very, very importantly, to show what digital tools could do at, at local level, to bring people together, to market. And so this is an example, we, this was only took place now about two or three weeks ago, it was a great success. And it really helped push the communities who are being involved, who would be involved in this, to actually say, right, this is fantastic. How can we use these tools now to really support and help our communities? So I think this is this is one of the things you've actually got to show them in operation. And this is a, a, an excellent example of the way Interreg Europe project can then be innovative in showing how digital tools could be used. Final slide now, Mark. Thank you. Where we are now within the project, and I think this is a something that comes out of COVID, but also it comes out of the rural situation. I think Mark was talking about this at the beginning, and all of you as well. Rural Europe is different than metropolitan Europe. They're different characteristics, so we have to have digital, digital and wider innovation, which is appropriate to its needs. Now, one of the key issues and this came out so, so strongly within the COVID crisis, is how do you get the, the food from local producers to consumers? There are hundreds of platforms, there are hundreds of different systems now in operation, but if you're really to be effective, you've got to create the tools which allow them to cooperate, work together, so that they can better supply the markets, they can better supply the needs of the producers, they can produce better logistics, so we've got some key, key points here that we this is now a current project within Carpe and one within the Nieva Valley. Is it, how do you use the micro hubs you're creating? What training can they provide? The ones near the towns, can they help us with this issue of last mile logistics? When we're looking at the issue of, um, for example, logistics, at the moment it's highly complex it's not a supermarket ordering its lettuces from the southern spain getting in touch with the logistics company getting them provided of course there's technical issues there it's you've got hundreds of different producers you've got many different markets small markets who are placing lots of different orders it's about how you create the tools which enable this complex system to operate effectively and then, like, for example, the posting logistics platform for recovered food waste, there's going to be food. How can you then use these platforms that you're creating to actually deal with the issue of food waste? And then, for example, the one of the final issues was actually, can you produce and you work together on the on the issue of, for example, blockchain for SSC here, um, that sort of French one really for short supply chains. OK, and, and that's what now we're trying to do. There are two fantastic initiatives in France at the moment, looking at the issue of interop interoperable platforms, which you were talking about before. Basically, say how you can make the platforms which market local food interoperable, how they can use common languages. There's another one looking at the issue of logistics. So what we're doing really in the Nieva is seeing how we can get our local expertise to network within national projects, and then use the experience of our European partners to actually create these collaborative networks that ensure that knowledge, learning, understanding, research and practical experience are shared and co-developed together to meet the needs on the ground, which is to help our producers market their produce and sell their produce, transport their produce more, most, more effectively and how consumers can access that produce and ensure that the added value is kept within the rural community. So this is a key project and an example of how 
innovation is necessary and how it can be achieved through multi-layered, multi-faceted cooperation throughout Euro Europe, rural Europe. And thanks again, Mark, for your opportunity for the rest of the colleagues. And there we are. Good. Thank you very much, Clive. Uh, again, perfect timing for uh, your followed on from Olavi's uh, good uh, timekeeping. So that means a bit of pressure on our, the rest of us. Um, I, I think we'd all rather be uh, wine tasting than listening to a tier <laughs> one innovation expert uh, talk you through it. But it's an interesting story. And, and I think it, it brings home to the fact that policy making, policy explorations can also have a very practical and dare I say fun dimension. I mean, it's as you said, it, you'll remember that particular activity for a long time, I'm sure. And, we're all feeling rather jealous. We're in the wrong project. We could always arrange another one, perhaps. Yep. Well, uh, <laughs> we will we'll be have a word with the Joint through. Secretariat. I'm sure Torsten is, is penning the email as we speak. So, um, <laughs> so for our participants, um, put your questions in the chat and we'll come back to uh, Clive a little bit later. Thanks again. So um, now we're going to move to uh, Finland. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have Nineta Shanyatu with us. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the Bridges project, uh, but in particular, the, uh, the, the good practice around the Kantola uh, economic uh, cluster uh, competence center. But uh, Nineta, you're better placed than I am to, to tell us about it. So the floor is yours. Um, do you want to check your microphones on? Tell us you're I have, here. I have, I have Good. checked everything. Good. So um, I'll click to your first slide. Thank the floor you. is yours. I, I, thanks. I would like to thank uh, the Internet well, Program yeah. and uh, the Policy Learning Platform experts for inviting us, Bridges Project and the Regional Council of Kainu. I would. Um, we are very happy to present our. Uh, uh, Cantola a good practice. I have lost the presentation, Mark. I see myself, but not the presentation. It's very should worrying. Be back now. It should be back. Uh, it's not back, but I can talk by heart, but it's nice if it's back. It's, it's, so I can, I can see it. I cannot. OK. Why I cannot see it? Eugenie, can you see it? Uh, yes, I can see it. Maybe, Nineta, you need to click on the Go to Webinar uh, tab. I am at the webinar. Yes. And I see myself. And you don't see the presentation? No. Mm -hmm. I can open the presentation in parallel. Mm -hmm. but, but, don't worry. I mean, you can, if you, you know it off by heart, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the slides uh, and maybe it will come I back. I would like to stress something about the Cantola Good Practice. It is a good, Bridges project was planned in 2014 and 2015, and it was about uh, better delivery, more vis visible delivery of risk three policies. And one, the key issue it addressed was mismatches between the economic and research basis of the involved regions. And, in, and it was our priority to involve also different types of regions on the innovation scale. Uh, uh, one of the good practices we identified through the Bridges project during phase one was this Cantola good practice. Cantola good practice is important. Why? Because it's a very voluntaristic, voluntaristic approach in renewing and diversifying uh, baseline wood processing production in a town in Kainu called in in, in uh, not Kusam uh, sorry for Kuchmo and making it into a really wood processing cluster for um, wooden construction. The uh, the good practice can be identified. It is the URL of the good practice in the Interact Europe page, it is there, me, written in the presentation, which I hope everybody can see, but I don't see. Uh, and then what was behind this was that at the very start, that was already in the year 2004, and it was consolidated in the year 2008 and onwards, is that a uh, master plan was formulated in which 
the activities of the wood of the basic good wood processing industry were described from the perspective of forthcoming excellences what does this mean the master plan involved inputs from uh, Finnish organizations very advanced research organizations VTT and Luke Univ Alto University and also a university from Germany from Munich so there was a master plan for the development of the cluster along four lines. And then there were specific projects that could go, that could be implemented. There was a jointly defined uh, center for training of the personnel of the businesses in, uh, in the Cantola cluster that was part of everybody, so it was a kind of parallel work and training at the same time. The original was uh, fin financed by the, regional, uh, by the structural funds, and the regional council of Kainu, of course, played a big role, and the stakeholders included all these universities, the businesses, and uh, the municipality of Kuchmo. Also, the, the ESR, the social fund organization, which is called the Elikeskus Center in Finland. This, in the beginning, gave very great results. If we go on, we can see some of the, the companies in the presentation. You can see the companies in, uh, in Pukmo, in Kantola, and the kind of, of um, results or products they gave rise to. Uh, then the time passed, and by and by, because of uh, financial issues mostly, the initial orientation towards excellence was not totally maintained. And the cluster lost some momentum. This has been discussed a lot in the regional council with the municipality, with the stakeholders, with, and, and, and many people. The Cantola cluster has been um, presented in Finland and from our ministry team many times. In the year 2018, there was made a decision that the cluster should be renewed and it should be connected to the RIS 3 of the Kainu region. So, uh, an external it was uh, a consultant uh, had the task to make the cluster renewal plan. The cluster renewal plan was produced and submitted to the Regional Council of Kainu in 2019 when we were in the process of revising the existing RIS-3 and we made the new RIS-3 which we have sent to the Joint Research Center and I think it has been more or less received in good way. The, the, uh, the, new, the new plan is also linked to what we have been trying to do through the Bridges project, mainly to see if we can capitalize on the, the forest industry side streams and the ingredients that can be used for making new products or replacing non-sustainable products in this uh, cantal activities. At this stage, what we have is the, is the proof that it is possible to start from zero when it is starting from a concerted approach based on excellence, but with very, all the details well defined and, and really reach very good results. And it is possible to renew and renew the process, but you have to renew the, the inputs, the priorities. Now it will be digitalization also, but also we include the possibilities of circular economies, which were not a priority in the beginning, and also resource efficiency. And we hope through the new RIS-3 to be able to finance part of the activities of this new renewed cluster. And in the renewed effort, we have also included collaborations with businesses outside Kainu, call them FDI or not, collaboration with Business Finland, which is a very excellent tool, and also this research to business options. So this is where we are. I said it may be too fast because I don't have it in front of me. Please feel free to ask questions. We're back, uh, Ninetta, to the, the last slide. Uh, uh, 
because I think uh, uh, the uh, messages that you, you shared here, this one here, I think the cantilever reinventing itself. I think that's a particularly, uh, yeah, sorry, my slide, particularly important uh, message because the uh, tradition is that you know we we start something and it's very difficult to to change the direction of of the project. And here you've given us a process by which you've actually uh, enhanced it by learning from the uh, the delivery. Uh, and I think the third message I particularly liked here was the improved the customer orientation. Um, so uh, the, yes, this the, the, the a lot. Yeah, exactly. The renewal, but also what we know, what we have found out is that the place-based approach, it mm -hmm. is not, it should not be restricted to place-based inputs. Mm -hmm. Because from the beginning, the potential was um, identified according to excellence inputs and external ex excellence observers. Mm -hmm. This is one of the complementarities we have found to be very important when we need to have this industrial diversification and up, uh, industrial renewal, and when we we'll miss the critical mass. Many provincial areas of Finland, as we know, and Olaf knows also, have critical mass problems. So mm -hmm. this complementarity from the second reading of the potential of the region, we have found is very important. It, it is, let's say it is a legitimate process. Indeed, and I think you mentioned the training dimensions a number of occasions. The uh, you know the, the employees need to be brought uh, up to speed with new technology, new uh, approaches uh, for modernization. So it's both the yes. physical, the geographical, but also the human dimension. Yes, yes, and we are trying to do the things a little bit in parallel, not sequentially, mm. not work after training or vice versa but to have an interactiveness okay well we'll come back to the panel now um before and i'll ask the, the three speakers to and my colleague torsten to, to connect the camera we've got one last poll question so virginia i think you need to take control but the question is um based on your uh, own regional experiences and uh, and maybe having you know, absorbed some of the material that we've just heard um, what do you consider the main factors driving innovation in rural areas? And uh, we're being generous. You can answer, uh, well, put two answers uh, when you tick here. So the first one is linked to the access to digital and broadband infrastructures. The second one is uh, provision of dedicated business support premises. I think the examples that Clive gave us, sorry, uh, the portfolio of services that can be made available to uh, SMEs the presence of dynamic SMEs, you know, the leading companies that can be uh, uh, flagships in terms of selling your success stories. Uh, we've just heard from, from uh, Ninetta. Um, and the role of funding instruments, whether it's grants, vouchers, subsidies. So uh, if you would like to uh, respond to the poll, uh, and Eugenie, you can um, show us the answers as they come in. Hopefully. I think we've we've seen how all, all of these are, are relevant. So it's can basically finding yourself uh, putting some priority uh, on the the main messages that you think would be most relevant. But I think we'd all agree all of them are relevant. Well, hopefully we would agree that they are all relevant. So, do we have any results yet, uh, Eugenie? I'm sharing the results. Can you see them? I can see them, yes. So, uh, let's have a look. Hopefully, people can still see my, my screen or your screen. 80% uh, are looking at the support services. Uh, closely followed by the digital infrastructure, 73%. Uh, and then we've got the presence of uh, good and dynamic SMEs, uh, funding, and last but not least, the physical uh, facilities in all their forms. So 
interesting uh, set of answers. So that's uh, give us some food for thought for our discussion uh, session now we're going to move into. So um, back to our, our speakers, if we could, uh, uh, let's have a look at the cameras. Uh, Ninetra, I don't know if you're going to be able to click on, um, but uh, Torsten is going to be, uh, helpfully, hopefully uh, pick up some of the questions that the attendees, so don't hesitate to put messages. Uh, if it's a specific question to one speaker, please highlight. Uh, uh, I'll start the ball rolling while the Torsten is looking at the most interesting question. Um, come back to, to you, Olavi. Um, as we see often, the um, you know the, at a regional level we have silo policy making. Uh, you know, the left arm doesn't talk to the right one, etc. Um, to what extent are you and your colleagues in other DGs, you know, trying to sort of put together uh, a more you know broader based framework for for rural development initiatives and smart communities? Because um, you highlighted there are many different levers and those two big projects. Uh, you said they they bring together academics, they bring together SMEs, big companies. So, what what, what sort of interactions are you facilitating with your colleagues in other DGs? Right. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, indeed, uh, we see ourselves very much as uh, well. You know, I, I've, I've been saying that uh, I'm in the business of connecting people. <laughs> you, some of you may remember who else has used uh, that, but uh, uh, that that's really I, I I think we see ourselves as facilitators uh, and uh, very concretely uh, when we talk about these two projects uh, I, I I didn't go uh, in, into the kind of background on the commission side but uh, since you ask uh, well uh, they are actually co-funded between DG Connect and DG Agri so DG uh, Connect and DG Agriculture and Rural Development. 50-50 uh, co-funded and uh, well I'm the main project officer but uh, I have mm -hmm. uh, then uh, a co-project officer Doris Markar from uh, DG Agri side also working quite a lot with Alexia Ruby from the rural development mm -hmm. uh, side in DG Agri and then uh, I, I would want to say for example about the living in EU movement why, why was it launched in Oulu, Finland? Well, it was launched in Oulu because in the DG region, on the DG Regio side, uh, so DG Regional and Urban Development, mm -hmm. uh, there in the Urban Agenda Digital Transition Partnership, Oulu, together with uh, Estonia and, and Sofia from Bulgaria, where you know was one of the coordinators uh, of. Of, of that digital transition partnership. So that was already a, a, a DG Regio link. And now then uh, we are linking in the Living in EU movement uh, very much uh, with uh, our colleagues in DG Digit uh, who are working very closely with the interoperability side, European interoperability framework, for example, as well as the joint research center where we are, for example, uh, just uh, working on a minimal interoperability mechanism on the geospatial side. So that will now become one of the minimal interoperability mechanisms. We're also working with the verticals like DG Move, DG Ener. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, there, there's there's many of us, many Positive of us here. Signs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that. It's encouraging because I think a number of our regions will sometimes have a policy uh, entry point that's easier. Uh, some may not be familiar with DG Connect, but more be familiar with DG Agri or DG uh, uh, Regio, for example. So I think that that's uh, it's encouraging to see that process. Um, Torsten, are there any uh, uh, questions you'd like to share with the, with the panel? Uh, yep, thanks indeed. Uh, our audience is very active. Uh, commenting and raising questions. First, an acknowledgement to Clive, which I would like to share with the group. Fantastic example, Clive. Uh, it outlines the key ingredients for innovation, local collaboration, and the mix between bottom-up and top-down approaches. And then in uh, the same colleague, Enrique, he also shares his views uh, combined with a question, which I think is, is relevant for the group. 
Um, the smart specialization strategies do not support uh, rural innovation, but innovation in big agri-food businesses. Uh, for discussion, uh, what is there to support small communities and businesses to design and implement inno uh, innovation in non-agri sectors such as care, energy, education, mobility uh, in rural areas? And he underlines rural areas uh, that are dynamic, they will innovate. How do we trigger innovation in those rural areas? Also stressing the dimension of social innovation. And we've only got three days to answer that comprehensive <laughs> question. To us well, but, but I think uh, the point is about the support also for the non-traditional mm, sectors and the social yeah. innovation dimension. Mm, mm. Clive, do you want to start to try and answer that? And then Ninetta, please. Yeah. The D d I think, just to say, I think there was a question missing when you were asking what people, the key drivers were, because what we have found is you need two levels of <laughs> involvement and inclusion. Yes, you need to create the service, the support services, but it's also including and making relevant the, the innovation process for the whole of the community. Now, this could be, for example, and I just take the example of, of Lawn here, if you're looking at things like, I mean, you might not think paint, painting shutters is innovative, but it's what the community wants. Mm. When they were actually said, what do you want? Paint the shutters. That was the first thing. It wasn't about, they, okay, they already had fast, they, they had a 300 megabyte connection, which is pretty good for a rural town. But that was actually the first thing they said. So number one is actually ask people what they want. And it's not to base, and just go to what um, Emilica was saying about um, agriculture. Maybe actually what the rural farmers and the rural communities want is actually work on improving local supply chains. It's actually applying digital tools to local supply chains. <clears throat> it may be that the farmers are looking at a fab lab to enable them to create some small pieces they may need for machinery so they, so they don't have to order it and it costs a lot of money. They may actually, the, the people at the school may need a project so if they're looking at computer programming, it may be one that's appropriate to their needs. So it's about finding different ways to include all people, seniors, school children, farmers, rural businesses, whatever, in the community of innovation. And I think that that's the key. It's so how that's done depends on your, your own, uh, clearly on your own situation. It could be done through associations. It could be done through local government. It's really appropriate to the particular place, but, you, but that's one of the keys. It's finding the way to actually include and involve. And then I think creating that community of innovation is the first thing. And that can be at all different levels, locally, internationally. And it gradually you're including that rural community in the European dimension. So it's this step by step approach and inclusion at all levels. Okay. But again, you said we spend three days on this. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fascinating question. It's a, Dinetta, what's your take on, on that particular issue? I would like to say that in the British project, we had a similar situation with our partner from Slovenia. S4 does not foresee measures for smaller businesses and so on. What the partner did, they, they worked through the CLLD to instruments. So they were able to finance. Those who aren't masters of all the acronyms, tell, tell us all what a CCLD is. It is for a, it is a structural funds part, mm -hmm. uh, but it is for local community development. And they got special permission because uh, it is correct. The Slovenian uh, RIS 3, which is called S4, does not foresee actions for the small communities and small traditional businesses. Mm. That's correct. However, they managed to make a collaboration through the local development uh, instrument. Of course, they had uh, consulted and discussed at central level, and they were able to make this research to business development actions for, the, for sustainable uh, fish farming that was part of the knowledge transfer in uh, the Breeders project. So this is my experience that it, what the colleague said that about, the, about Latvia, it is so that in some countries it can be like that, but that was the solution we found in the Breeders project and it worked. Mm -hmm. 
Now we are going on, just to, to add, I have a few minutes remaining from the short presentation, please allow. We have a follow-up action in the Bridges project, maybe, of course, Mark and also knows. And we have negotiated that we will reach the national level where it needs to be reached. Because we have also the good background from phase one in the Bridges project. Mm -hmm. We will see. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Nieta. The, I mean, uh, for someone, you know, I, I've worked in a number of regions where S3s are being designed and uh, implemented. And I think there, you know, we know there's the process of consultation uh, when it's looking at the business opportunities, uh, known as the entrepreneurial discovery process. Uh, we know, as Ninetta highlighted there, the S3 becomes S4 with the sustainability and dimensions and one of the you know, important, you know, uh, this week, the Green Deal transition measures were, were, were published. Um, so I, I really do think in, 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 in good regions, the, the consultation process is not about this is the strategy, uh, what do you think? It's how that construction has taken place. And as Clive said, you've got to find those actors on the ground and the intermediaries need to facilitate that process to make sure yeah, it's, uh, it's half your territory. Uh, the, the digital dimension is important. Innovation uh, is in any activity in, in any company uh, as we know you know people prefer cutting ribbons on big new fdi factories but you can create sustainable jobs in rural areas in a, in a, in a completely different way by local engagement so i think uh, the process of construction uh, is there in some regions you have an overarching economic strategy uh, which is you know is the sort of the mother strategy above an s3 or s4 um, they tend to be much more local generated uh, priorities. So I think that might be a, a way of getting a good uh, coupling. Um, Torsten, are uh, other hot questions on the, uh, on, the, on the chat you want to share with the panel? I think we have one more interesting uh, question which directly relates to your words, Mark. Mm -hmm. Question coming from Karen uh, from Southern Ireland. So addressing the entire panel, what are your thoughts on a smart region approach? We are working on a framework here in the southern region of Ireland as an en enabler for a regional S3 and regional innovation approach. Well, Avi, what's your take on, on, on that type of uh, question, a smart region? You're a smart community, man. You must know what a smart region uh, can deliver. <laughs> You're, you're uh, muted, well, sorry. Uh, from, I like, think from no. our point of view, ah, sorry. No, it's good now. No, no it's okay now. Uh, so uh, we have actually uh, been discussing this uh, quite a lot uh, during the, the May uh, conference uh, led by the Portuguese presidency. And uh, those of you who are who are interested, I, I uh, really recommend uh, for you to uh, to go uh, and and listen to some of those presentations. But um, I, I think what what we are uh, seeing is that uh, we have um, well, I have actually worked for the last 15 years with with Living Lab experimental approaches, and and there uh, that that was actually I had a project about 15 years ago, which was called Collaboration at Rural. And, and there, I think we kind of started with this regional approach. For example, we had a Turku Archipelago living lab. And because quite often uh, the, the small communities, they don't have the critical mass by themselves. So even if we now say, uh, well, you know, we want to go and uh, really work with the kind of front runner uh, small communities like even the, the the villages the smart villages well some of them may, may be ready to go and work uh, collaboratively uh, in internationally europe-wide but many of them will not and and there we have clearly realized that well it actually needs the regional uh, scale uh, then 
to, to be, let's say, critical size. And I, I, I think that's kind of the, the, the very concrete thing which we have, for example, in the Alentesu conference uh, come, come up to that uh, mm -hmm. some of these minimal interoperability mechanisms approaches, for example, there may be very few smart villages who want to talk about them directly, but when they then reach together uh, the, the smart region approach, well, that actually may be the right scale to be talking together with uh, cities and together with the international uh, collaboration partners. Now, that's just my short first reaction, but uh, do do uh, do go and look at the uh, longer presentations. Mm. Thanks for reminding. Clive, I mean, you, you, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, the, the Morvan and, and Lourma are on the sort of periphery of a quite a large uh, region. Uh, to what extent did the sort of S3 uh, strategy development process, do you think, engage uh, to ensure the sort of smart region vision was, uh, you know, A, took into account rural communities, but in general, the smart uh, dimension? But referring to 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 Lorm, it was almost the other way around that it was the example of of Lorm, and i think it's important to point out the the wider region which is the niven et morvan and, and the nievre that it actually inspired those strategies and it the, i mean this the, the process started in 1998 i mean we're looking at years yeah. ago and they weren't in place but actually, many of these are actually the basis of some of the strategies in, in rural France at the moment. And just to make a reference to the rurality contracts, which are now one of the key instruments for promoting innovation and development and um, digital development in, in rural France, the LORM together with the rest of the pay or the, uh, let's say, the grouping of local authorities there now is able, because of its developing its own capacity, to actually engage with the county, with the region and with the state in providing services which are part of the, of the smart specialization mm -hmm. strategies. So they, it's more, it's, it's now a process of partnership that, for example, the regional and smart specialization strategy is informed by inspirational in, innovative mm -hmm. practices on the ground. And for example, within the region of Burgundy, there's now a network of um, fab labs and maker spaces and that's a key part of the strategy. It's actually, we're not just going to have a digital innovation hub based on a single um, location in Dijon. It's actually a networking approach within Slovenia, another partner. There's the national network of, of fab labs. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, I think it's, it, it's a two way process. It's helping the people who are setting up the strategies to be better informed of what's happening and what the potential of rural Europe is, and then using that strategy to further develop capacity within the rural areas to meet the real needs. So it's a, uh, and that wasn't a, a direct answer to your question, but it's, it's kind of showing that there is this necessity for the partnership and for, the, and, and it, and for these strategies not to be developed by a by, let's say, a regional government in the case, on its own or the national government. It must be mm. done in partnership with key actors in the rural areas. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and not just the manufacturer of, of pink paint, because I'm, I'm sure uh, when that idea came across, we can see all the villages in Burgundy uh, with pink shutters. He'd be, he'd be delighted for that uh, supply <laughs> contract. Yeah, that, 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 that would be very interesting, particularly because they used to yeah. use pig's blood to make pink paint in rural areas so okay. there we maybe we shouldn't have gone down that avenue mark <laughs> um, yeah. on the issue and on that last survey and i was intrigued to see that services came up top uh nanetta in in your presentation you were talking about you know the, the competent competence center the sort of technology knowledge um to what extent uh, you know, there's quite a lot of forestry in, in, in Finland. To what extent uh, it was your initiative part of a network of other uh, competence centers, or was it a unique one that was Finnish wide? Uh, how did that uh, uh, impact on the sort of you know, other rural development uh, projects or strategies? It was not a network of competence centers, but it was meant to be a competence center that transfers and tailors the knowledge of excellence organizations mm. to regional needs and makes them accessible. It was the quality of knowledge 
the potential of new types of uses of uh, side stream ingredients that were turned into project schemes, project concepts. That is what, what made it work in the first place. Uh, and then it was linked also to the Tajani, Amati, Korkia, Kolu, and so on. But in terms of excellence inputs, it is not a work of network. It is the end point of many excellence organizations that mm. were contacted and were contracted to be able to, to serve the development of a business community. Mm. A small one. Uh, what happened in terms, besides the wood processing, uh, Kuchmo has been able to have this uh, renewable energy. It is one of, was one of the first small towns in Finland. It reached renewable energy many years ago at 80%. Mm -hmm. However, and this co goes on, it has, it has become self-sustaining. I think this is big success when a good process that works becomes self-sustaining. However, it needed to be renewed to take into account new demand-led realities, both excellence-based and market-based. Mm -hmm. And we are going from there on, especially circular economy. Mm -hmm. I think a common theme in, in both of your three answers was this notion of critical mass and whether you create yes. it through a, a network, whether you create it through a success story that inspires others, uh, the rural uh, dimension clearly, uh, you know, one community of a thousand people can't deliver or can't offer the whole range of services. So, sharing yes. those networks, sharing those good practices. Um, um, we, 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 sorry, Clive, did you want to add? Yeah, it was it was just through also listening to Nuneta then, and I mean, one of the things that we've been working on in Carpe Diem a lot is this. I mean, again, looking at the digital. Field, it's the digital brokerage and mediators and we found that the most successful um, system for, in, for, for actually transferring you know, for inclusion of business and local authorities in innovation is to have people on the ground who can act as those bridges and those digital in, in mediators and intermediaries and they need to be close to both they need to be close to the to the people producing innovation products and the people who need the innovation products yeah. and unless you have that that's somebody who can understand both of those sides you're, you're that which is going to be there if you take a rural sme or a very small rural or local authority they don't have the capacity and we've, this is capacity yeah. building to be able to do that a rural business of three people does not understand what the digital technologies yeah. are appropriate to its business style so they need someone to do that and they need somebody who has an unbiased opinion there are plenty of salesmen yeah. around, but they need somebody who is mm. who is there for their interest. Mm. And I think that's one of the key things we're creating that, and that's mm. really needs underlining, I think, in this mm. case. Okay. I think Olavi wanted to react to, to that point. Uh, yeah, well, uh, on your overall point about the critical mass and the importance of critical mass, mm. uh, it, it depends on kind of critical mass for what? Uh, because uh, what we have seen, for example, when we have been discussing with our uh, our oral coordinating region uh, in Alentejo, uh, in Portugal, where they are really leading the, the regional uh, <coughs> management or leader, leadership organization is actually leading this large scale pilot. And then they, and, but they have actually a, network of smart villages in several of the participating countries mm -hmm. is at the core mm -hmm. and, and this is kind of what you know Clive was saying as well that that actually much of the inspiration the creativity it, it comes from this uh, network of smart villages or smart communities at the mm -hmm. core but then for example when they started talking about well you know we want to participate in the living in EU movement mm -hmm. uh, now who's gonna sign well they decided in Alentejo for example they decided that it's the regional president rather than all the mayors of all these mm -hmm. villages uh, who wants to sign and then they will have be like facilitating this international cooperation mm -hmm. so it's 
critical mass for what? It, mm. Some of the critical mass may be, uh, you know, at one level and some like the international yeah. cooperation. You, you, you adapt it to the level, level. indeed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. if I was in the audience today and uh, and there's one question I, I would be it's burning on my uh, lips, and uh, uh, it's the, the the remark you made, Olavi, with the de rural project. Uh, the word cascade funding is not only music to my ears because I think it's important to to have those processes and to to uh, to uh, you know in, in, enables a different engagement. We we dealt with it uh, in a number of uh, uh, PLP events. Um, what is the timing, roughly, and what are we talking about? Is it the sort of a, the former Horizon 2020 innovation vouchers up to 60,000, or is it more smaller scale? Can you give us a bit more, you know, insight into what, when this cascade funding and what it would look like? Right. Uh, so, well, first of all, <clears throat> I, I very much uh, support the idea overall of, of cascaded funding. Uh, mm -hmm. There may be different uh, opinions on different uh, sides, but uh, I have always been uh, very much in favor uh, because it really gives the opportunity to take part of the, uh, an important part of the funding for these smaller uh, pilots. Uh, in this case, uh, well, uh, I think uh, in the case of the rural, uh, if I remember correctly, it's about uh, 2 million plus uh, out of the 14, 15 million, uh, which is uh, reserved for the cascading funding. So for these smaller pilots uh, in our rural, it's, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it's uh, slightly less than 2 million. But anyway, it, it's an important uh, sum because it also makes you part of the community. Uh, I, I think it, well, it, it's good to kind of follow the project through. Now, the rural is three and a half years, our rural is four years. Uh, it, I, I think, you know, next year at the latest, you should be following uh, what is happening to be already thinking about if you may be interested in uh, what is it that they are developing, which or co-developing, which then you might want to apply to the cascading funding, which then maybe uh, in in that kind of you know tens of thousands, uh, okay. well, quite a few tens of thousands, but still, it's not only the funding; it's often it's the co Experience. cooperation yeah. spirit yeah. and cooperation network and connections that may be actually mo even more important. Both are needed, funding and uh, the connections, they are both needed. <laughs> but, but also you become part of this, let's say 15 million funded or 30 million funded. <clears throat> and then which is part of this even bigger, you know, getting together of all the projects. Although you yourself may be getting, you know, 60,000 or whatever, but but still mm -hmm. just to say that, that, that I think they are very important ways of putting into use, widespread use, mm. uh, whatever has come out of this overall co-development process. Mm. Well, thanks for that. I think that's something to indeed for everyone to put on their agenda, uh, including us at the policy learning platform, because I think it's a, a trend that we've seen the strong interest in this uh, webinar, which unfortunately is coming to an end. And Eugenie uh, is going to tell me off of, making you talk too long because um, everyone kept to time apart from me on this. I should have finished three minutes ago, but uh, um, uh, Torsten, is there any final word you want to say before I, I do a, a one minute summary? Uh, well, of course, your message about the wine tasting, uh, well taken, but but seriously, you know, I think uh, I think many points taken up uh, or many points which we have to take up. No, I leave the final words for you, Mark. I just remind everybody uh, before you leave or when you leave you will be invited to fill in an evaluation form please make use of this possibility share us mm -hmm. tell us if uh, you have enjoyed this webinar what you could do better and on the content mark i give back to you for the final conclusions yeah. okay well very briefly so firstly thank you to the three speakers uh, each of you had an inspirational in, uh, insights into what's happening uh, at the rural slash innovation interface which is uh, I always learn as much as uh, I think, uh, well, more than I th imagine. 
what I what I heard then is a couple of messages is the the importance of connecting both within the the rural dimension that is developing in a project or initiative, but I think as Olavi just highlighted, if you get into a, a project, the project is a stepping stone to something much wider, uh, whether it's a sort of an association, whether it's a project working group, or whether it's a EU wide initiative for driving a policy dimension. Um, number of you asked questions on the strategic dimension and S3 uh, or slash S4 uh, was highlighted certainly by, by, by Ninetta uh, and Clive in their presentations and I think those are vehicles for pushing forward uh, a stronger rural dimension. I think we'd agree that those elements are, are you know, sometimes undercooked and the higher priority goes for the flagship projects, you know. I know in Burgundy, the S3 funding was looking for big projects, 10 million plus. Well, you know, you can buy a lot of paint for 10 million, so it's not going to work. You have to find things that are adaptable in, in, in scale. Uh, I was pleased to see the synergies that uh, Olavi mentioned with other DGs, and I think that's something we try and facilitate at Policy Learning Platform, and hence we uh, we, we invite DG Connect. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, on this panel. Um, but the digital dimension, we've, we've done w w webinars on, on this before, and I think we are now getting up to speed, say we in the regions, as this is a, this is a priority uh, that is well understood, and it's now part of the EU-wide, uh, you know, uh, Thierry Breton, when he from DG Grow, the Commission of DG Grow, he says, you know, the challenges are the digital. This is, you know, we want Europe to become the most competitive environment for the digital dimension and the green transition. Um, so we think that, you know, rural, and this is my last message, the rural communities have a real role to play in driving this agenda and making sure that you pass that message through the regional policy makers. It goes up because you are. Uh, in the rural areas, key focus for experimentation, uh, but as Clive said, success stories. As Ninetta said, adapting your competence centers in your you know, key sectors for making sure their sustainability and more resilient rural communities, which will um, come being back to what we hear a lot about is rural depopulation. We heard of examples today of rural in migration and growing populations. So. Um, positive but uh, lots of effort and networking uh, to de develop the, the, the right strategies for rural areas so thank you again um, we're two minutes over due so as Torsten said please uh, look complete the survey please also follow up with the speakers their email details uh, are part of the uh, presentation so you will be uh, sent and look also at the other policy learning platform initiative in particular peer review you know if you want to take a, a peer review for example we haven't had any in Finland for some unknown reason you can look on the map and see where uh, the peer review brings experts uh, to a you know physical uh, with or without wine tasting but um, bring the, the the knowledge that other regions can help uh, and accelerate your your learning so thank you again Phil for your patience on running over a few minutes and um, we're probably going to be back online with new events in September. So don't forget to follow us on the uh, policy learning platform. So Eugenie, I think we can close the uh, thing with a little wave from me and our speakers. Goodbye, everyone, and have a good and safe summer. And uh, see you all in, in September uh, with, the, again, the program of the Tier 1 Innovation and Research. Cheerio. Thank Thanks to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Moi, moi.